Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, this episode is going to be a short one, hopefully. I wanted to just share my commentary on how to use and wield imagination. On the importance of the position of the human mind. Now, every person in history who has come to speak about the human mind has been limited to how far their eyes have opened to the world. And I noticed this. I noticed this that every human being is climbing the mountain of their inner realms to reach the peak of the conclusion of why their mind is being in a world right now. Philosophers have a strange honor. Their honor is, in some sense, sending messages through a bottle. But that bottle is made of words. And I want to bring up the specific figure, Friedrich Nietzsche. There is something he said that I often refer to in these talks. Friedrich Nietzsche said God is dead and man killed him. And that sentence has echoed to me in so many different ways where I have felt that what is God in some sense something that has arose to man's mind. So in some sense man's greatest effort to in some sense humanize the universe is being forgotten. Because if the macrocosm is not human, the microcosm is human, the microcosm will soon no longer, uh, I don't know how to say it, but I feel... It's not just that we have to... Uh, be human, we have to put an effort to be human. When Friedrich Nietzsche said God is dead and man killed him, he was giving a warning to the future generations that an ability to imagine the universe animate is being denied. Now, <clears throat> of course, the religious effort has gone far in many dimensions and not in all dimensions smoothly. But this notion of God and this notion of when one closes their eyes, there is something being here. And man being left in a, to a point where all that is intelligent in the universe can't be shaped in human. We can't accept it as a, like, I don't know how to say it. That message in a bottle, for example, to a philosopher live now from Friedrich Nietzsche, I, th I feel the next victim, the next thing that man is going to nullify is in some sense going to be the unknown. And that is the most intense and I would say inner extinction things that man can do. Therefore, a preservation of the unknown. The whole point of me sharing this thing from Friedrich Nietzsche is that the unknown is going to be dehumanized and our attempt and effort as human beings should be to more and more humanize it. This means we saw intelligence in the object, we saw intelligence in the subject, and we see intelligence beyond the object and subject, therefore in the unknown. If there's intelligence in the unknown,
excuse me. Let me start from a different imagery. We are human beings. Um, we open our eyes as objects. What moves the object becomes a subject based on the decisions one makes. So in some sense, we are this receiving instrument. We receive phenomenology and our response through our response to it, we humanize. I would say this, <clears throat> right now as I'm speaking to you, there is an objective reality and existence going on. Then there's the mind as a space where this existence is happening. The mind seems to be watching from just the eyes alone, but the eyes are like a channel of information and the body has different channels. Think of um, what I mean by the channel, I'm talking about like the senses. We have different senses. Now we feel our attention is localized right where our eyes open to the world and therefore the sensory is being prioritized. But if one closes their eyes and stares at what is left behind, and if when one closes their eyes, you will your attention, because it is in your eyes first, you will see the pitch black, the, the uh, sort of like your eyes are covered, there isn't light coming in. Now, if, in, if one keeps, if one stays, in the silence and stillness and the pitch black abyss of where their image where like when their eyes were open they saw something and when they closed they see the remnants of the outlines <clears throat> of of what they saw if the if one just st stays in that space and stabilizes to a point where it doesn't matter if the person's eyes are open it doesn't matter if the person's eyes are closed one can notice the silence, the stillness, the absence of phenomenology. You know, it's kind of like waiting with yourself, I would say. <clears throat> or watching your own moment of being like a cinema. So, as I'm speaking, where these words are coming from, ultimately the conclusion, it's like a, like a, double, like a coin where we, are, we only get to see the expression in one side of the coin. <clears throat> now, theories I have on what is going on and why the mind is active to even receive imagination is that it feels like the earth is soil and it feels like intelligence was planted in it to some degree because there is a sort of expansion and growth of the realm. It's strange as if there's a world here uh, um, for a self to do things in, you know. It would have been, let's say there were three ways we could see the world kind of happen. For Imagine one where there were just creatures hovering in space. We couldn't explain that. <laughs> imagine another world where we are in some sense creatures on earth and another world where we are disembodied completely. When I say disembodied, it's because the body is all we know. It's like a vehicle. And so to tell someone that there's other vehicles beyond their vehicle... How many people are willing to uh, see more than their eyes? Very few people. Most people, I feel, they want to settle into their sight and therefore they have belief systems tame them. It's highly automatic. A lot of the human intelligence is involuntary. 
I would say out of all the things, all the activities taking place, like I'm not thinking about my heart for it to beat. I'm not thinking about all the internal systems of the body. They're under the administration of the body, like nature, <clears throat> you know. But when it comes to moving my hand in the air, speaking, uh, coordinated movements, it, it seems like the body is an opportunity and something beyond it takes it. And not to dismiss the morale of the higher dimensions, but, but to say that this world is strange, and it is strange now in multidimensional ways. And we have feared the multidimensional. And through the religious narrative, it has been seen as blasphemy, even though the religious narrative is incredibly multidimensional. From the, from the view of the secular, your imagination has been exiled. Why? Because reality has to have a shape. And really, how many human beings can be shapeless in their own presence? I feel maybe one in a hundred. Because on one manner, it's like a relationship with oneself. It's a relationship with other senses of self in the outer realms, other beings. <clears throat> and then it's a relationship with the world. That means it's as if we don't realize. It's as if the world is speaking to us. We don't hear it. <clears throat> and <laughs> let's say others speak to us and we don't hear it. You know, And then we speak to ourselves and we don't hear it. Three angles. And it could be one intelligence. And every decision is just sh changing its geometry. For me, there was a sort of fool's uh, looking behind the fool's shoulder thing going on in my life. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> it's like living through one's own foolishness. And in that foolishness, getting clues of what is the truth of nature. The attention can be on oneself, then the self becomes victorious. The attention can be on others, others become victorious. The attention can be on the world, the world becomes victorious. Or the attention can go straight to the world and the self and the others are part of it. That means if man, the shortcut to an advanced civilization is actually living for the world, which includes everything else in it. That means if parents could just tell their children, it's like, son, daughter, live for your planet, for God's sake. <laughs> In the chat section, Lorna says, if we all knew we were coming back for eternity, maybe treat it better. It's not etern it, It's not that kind of eternal. It, eternity for an advanced civilization. <clears throat> it's not one, one pattern that just echoes till the end of time. You see, karma is a room. You enter that room, you have to live by the, room, the rules of that room. 
you pilot beyond that room you come at, you come to the unconditional mind the unconditional mind is how intelligence was before anything happened to it that original intelligence neither has reality neither has imagination so you're ultimately rendered as just a watcher of all that is as all that is being because there is, we can't make our mind inseparable from the world. I feel the highest wisdom is that there's a universe happening and it's not that we are a part of it. <clears throat> we are it. It's as if one can say my hand is a part of me, but the hand is connected to the rest of the body, you know. Best case scenario, human species realizes as the giant question mark and the greatest uh, revolution in exploration of all dimensions of humanity begins. Best case scenario. Worst case scenario, people still fight over how language is masking something so dynamic and vast that it's like, how can you, <clears throat> you know, measure a waterfall in a teacup? It's like impossible. So in some sense, to wield imagination, I would say means that if reality is like ice, um, the state of mind, the person's pleasantness, let's say, the person's serenity with the realm, you know, that means there's been moments I've experienced where I feel like they call, they call it bliss, but it's, it's not a bliss, it's not like a regular bliss of just, <clears throat> um, it's not the bliss of conditional, needs being met it's a bliss of its own accord it's a bliss um uh, it's a it's a self bliss <clears throat> and uh, i feel when one ex experiences this self bliss they instantly recognize the idea that they feel is being them and is moving them is in some sense like a limb so your mind feels like you're extension of your you it can if you want to wield it when i say wield it i'm saying that means in this in this station of let's say human conscious activity if we want to wield our intelligence multidimensionally We must accept ourselves as this dimension. Because if one doesn't accept something, that means many things are very easily, the person accepts it, moves past it, never even doubts it. <clears throat> but there are some things that the person can't accept, and that's where the attention of life goes to, in what the person can't accept yet. The more one becomes selfless, the more the inseparability of the self's activity and the world's activity is noticed, the more automatically everything happens to a point where one, there is no, like every, everything Carl Jung was saying, that the conscious mind has to make the unconscious conscious. And then there's uh, so many archetypes in the void that it just meet us as we animate. I would say these are the steps into at least wielding some from one human being's perspective wielding the higher intelligence <clears throat> you let go of this higher lower thing you let go of memories not in the sense that you're trying to forget something or you're trying to attain something you let things be as they are that's the first thing that means there is no effort towards anything kind of like when a person sits to watch something it's like they're not trying to see something they're just seeing something with that same 
simplicity and acceptance of sight, as one becomes selfless, one begins noticing how beyond the language threshold, that means when I say beyond the language threshold, all the words after, they can't, they're just shadows of what I'm saying. <clears throat> An automated experience moves because the only reason we need uh, something, we need a technique or a method or all of these things, is because the self feels it doesn't know. Once the self, once the unknown self and the unknown world, there's a contentment. So first you, you experience your known self and the known world, then you come to realize they're inseparable. <clears throat> Through that inseparability, you either notice something from the unknown world or you notice something from the unknown self. If the person notices after they, they just kind of notice, okay, everything's the periodical periodic table reincarnating as civilizations. <laughs> it's like the inseparability in the outer realms of the known self and the unknown self. And then it's the inseparability of the unknown the unknown self and the unknown world and after that there is contentment that means because there is no problem there's no reason to be anything so it's just being so i would say it's not like there is there i should say it's not like there is life or death <clears throat> it's kind of like pure being and impure doing The mind is alive. It is not alive in the sense that a human being can personalize it, but they have to watch their intelligence. <clears throat> there are moments where I have noticed that it's it's kind of like, unless the conscious attention is there, it's okay, here, I'll tell you an example. <clears throat> Let's say you're in a forest, you look to your right, you see an eagle, you look to your left, uh, you look in front of you, 90, angle, 90 degree angle, you look in front of you and you see uh, a bear, you look you, 90 degree angle, you see a cobra. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I don't know, let's say eagle, bear, cobra. The eagle... You look at the eagle, but when you look at the bear, you preferably see the eagle. When you look at the cobra, you don't see the eagle. You see the bear in your peripheral vision. So, similarly, for our human body, I find it to be very true that the attention that is not on the body, one can get distracted from their own body. I find this kind of... This is possible. And so it's as if like how many people when they move around through the day actually consider being their back. Like you can see the front of your body, but you can't see your elbows and you can't see behind that. Do you know? So when a person is walking, it's as if they're just the front of their body consciously, you know? To be conscious of your back, imagine you have to like touch points in your back to feel something. You know, <clears throat> and I'm not, I'm just saying how powerful attention is, is in overlaying upon the objective realm, a subjective realm. And that subjective realm, its power of where our attention goes on it is, is so different. And let me tell you why we have an inner realm. Close your eyes. And if you see something, where are you seeing that? Right. I'm not saying that it's exactly in the outer realms, but I'm saying the inner realms is an overlay. Anybody who, uh, avoid, like, we can't ignore evolution made an object into a subject to itself. Like, There's so many ways to put it, 
what your body can be found in your mind or your mind can be found in your body the issue of completely entertaining a materialistic perspective is that it nullifies a reason to be animate in the world that means if nothing is alive why are we you know it could make one feel like lonely right but but when we look at it in the sense where there has been the emergence of a free will and it's a rare opportunity because it's temporary all li that life can be is an opportunity really <clears throat> now how should that opportunity be used where should the efforts of human beings go and if every person's paying attention to take care of themselves when is this i when is the update of the civilization gonna go right like we can say if let's say <laughs> let's say we're eight billion people right so let's say eight billion people they all were like okay we're gonna meditate okay we heard this youtube video i'm convinced you know and eight billion people just start studying how they are minds in the moment rather than bodies right that's not a good thing it has to have a balance right because in a, in a realm where we're living too in accordance to the inner realms and the wealth of the inner realms, like the the inner realms are kind of like, like a treasure uh, treasure chest that it's like those who who it's like you can open it, right? And the the glow inside it could be too much, and then you have to cl cl close it quickly. Do you know? <laughs> That's an interesting metaphor, but <clears throat> so I'm saying that it's like taking responsibility for one's known dimensions and unknown dimensions the known dimensions become because we can see is easy the unknown dimensions one has to train one has to train their intelligence you have to you have there's this thing i say um, <clears throat> um george Paton said you must serve before you command and the ancients said uh in some sense, uh, the mind is a lousy master, but it's a great servant. And it's this weird thing where you got to serve your foolish mind by trusting your intelligence, but not being too rash in the deci decision making, you know? <clears throat> you know what it is? It's, it's kind of like in any moment having the ability like crouching tiger hidden dragger to just step on a leaf and bounce in the air. <laughs> in an advanced civilization there would be no more anger people would just fly like you know enlightened martial artists like <laughs> away from anger We can say our intelligence is a gift from the earth to itself. By serving the observable realm, we build within ourselves a momentum to keep observing a physical realm. Now that momentum doesn't need to be completely gotten rid of in the serious renunciation of the yogis or to be completely dismissed in, in our modular, uh, modern uh, uh, <clears throat> ignorance. The mind is like a, like a horse. And I'll tell you the story that is actually a yogic story for... Um, 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 metaphorizing these four uh, paths of yoga <clears throat> but anyways the story begins with a king and this king um, uh, wants to you know commands the kingdom to bring him the greatest horses and they bring him the greatest horses but these horses are crazy they look majestic but they're crazy <laughs> And so nobody can put a saddle on these horses and people try and the kingdom, the king is watching. It's like, what is this? You know, what kind of kingdom do I have? <laughs> Uh, 
Nobody in the kingdom can put the saddle on the horses. Nobody can tame these horses. They all get broken limbs and the horses don't let them. And all this until this one yogi, this one, let's not say yogi, one guy who, <clears throat> you know, did yoga. <laughs> He comes and tells the king, I can do this, but under one condition. And the king says, what? <clears throat> and the guy says, I need a year. <laughs> I need one year and I'll tame these horses. Nobody in the kingdom can do it. So the king's like, okay, if in one year uh, <clears throat> you're not back, there will be consequences. And so this guy, they, they give him a wagon with the horses and he takes the horses and he goes off. <clears throat> a year passes, you know, a little bit more than a year. The king's getting angry. Suddenly, to this, to the guy's surprise, the guy is riding one of the horses, and the three other horses are, in some sense, following behind him. Uh, completely tamed. These savage horses were completely tamed, and so the king is shocked, and the king's like, "Oh my God, you did it." You know, and the king invites him, you know, to have dinner with the king, you know, in the palace and whatever. And at the dinner table, you know, the king says, you have to tell me why you said one year. <clears throat> and this uh, guy tells him, uh, excuse me, uh, as the king says, you have to tell me why you said one year and how you did this. <clears throat> and he says it. He says, oh, everybody in your kingdom... Just put the saddle on the horse. And the horse, um, like they just tried to put the saddle right away and the horses freaked out. <clears throat> so this guy, what he did was he took the horses, he's saying to the king, he says to the king, I took the horses to this field. And I just said, let them be free for a while. And the horses just went free, you know. <clears throat> the guy didn't try to tame the horses. Then the guy, what he did was um, he went beside the horses and he started eating with them. Whenever they would eat uh, graze, he would eat his lunch. Whenever they would drink water, he would go by the river and, I don't know, drink water or something. <clears throat> and everywhere the horses went, this guy went with them to a point where the horses started to accept this guy. And what happens is the horses started feeling he's a, you know, weird horse. You know, and I, I'm starting to remember, I think I heard this story from Sadhguru, you know. <laughs> but what happens is the horses, <clears throat> Sadhguru says much better, but, but the horses, what happens is the horses uh, uh, accept the guy. <clears throat> and... Eventually the guy he climbs on one of the horses and the horses doesn't like it and a week passes then he tries it again tries it again and eventually he puts the saddle on right so he first puts his hand the horse doesn't like it then he puts the saddle on the horse doesn't like it he like it lets there be time and he tries it again <clears throat> and then eventually the horses accept him or something I don't know <laughs> the king is shocked the guy explained and I feel it's also <clears throat> similar for the paths of yoga the four paths of yoga they would say I could see the connection now um, so the, the paths of yoga, let's say there's Janana yoga, there is Raja yoga, Karma yoga, 
and bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is devotion and love those who through love are in some sense trying to discover the true nature of the realm the karma yogi is the yogi who is doing it through work just the effort so all those people who are doing hard work you could technically say a person in a gym lifting weights they are karma yogis from the yogic standpoint that means if a yogi was watching <clears throat> so there, that's the path of karma yoga where your actions and your efforts are leading to the consequence of your life force where you know <clears throat> now let's say there are those Uh, excuse me, after karma yoga, we have raja yoga, the path of knowledge. This is for, let's say, you know, the philosophers in their ivory towers, the um, scholars, you know, all the uh, intellectuals trying to explore, you know, how far the mind of man can go. <clears throat> so, in, when it comes to raja yoga, the path of knowledge, that's kind of like through knowing. You know, that's kind of... Um, okay, let's say it's like the explorer. Now, let me say, uh, then we had Janana Yoga. And so, the Janana Yogi was through meditation. And I would say the Janana Yogi, call it the classification for those that the divine moved them. As if in a chess game, some pieces the hand moves some pieces later on in the game you move so the janana yogi is different but anyways let's say the one who through meditation conscious uh enlightenment practices and whatever is trying to the truth seeker or whatever in that manner <laughs> and anyways anyways so these four now imagine this guy i explained to you in the story how the guy tamed the four horses, but then when he returns to the king, he's on one of the horses. So any yogi who is in one of the horses of, of yoga, you just have to realize, learn to be with the other yogis. You have to learn to be with the other yogas, but you can sit on a certain, on one of the horses and they can all follow, right? So that means, for example, when I give these, and you can even, let's say, take this to a point where if the mind was seen, if a person's life is seen as a line, every moment they experience is a dot of that line. <clears throat> so each dot could be like a certain horse one is riding. So the yoga one does is like the horse they're riding in samsara. <laughs> Or the vehicle they're piloting through. The path of intellect um, is very alone, lonely. Usually the explorer goes in the, if to sacrifice the edge of knowledge, it has to be go alone. Think of the astronauts, think of any explorer in, the, in our human history. The one who goes with effort, karma yogi, the karma yogi is not alone because there is work and then there's collective work, right? And collective work is when humanity acts like a giant. When eight billion creatures start doing, uh, ma making giant leaps in civilization. So the karma yogi is in, in the steering wheel right now. That means societies all around the world, your work, if people even go to get you go towards education, not for the sake of exploration. It's just to get, get a better job usually. So work has obsessed. It's like the, the, that horse is in, in <coughs> civilization seems to be dragged around by just working our way towards salvation, right? Now, let's say you're the Janana Yogi. The Janana Yogi is equivalent to a time traveler. The time traveler, instead of fixing the world, it's like, okay, in different timeline, you know, different time plane, you know, different time cube. <laughs> so,
So let's say somebody, there's there's somebody out there, the, the Bhakti Yogi. Let me talk about the Bhakti Yogi. The Bhakti Yogi is <clears throat> a shortcut. It is it is the simplest. That means for the, for the for the Raja Yoga, you require a sort of wielding the sharpness of the intellect. That means <clears throat> you have to use what you see for for the Raja Yogi. For the Karma Yogi. It's effort. That means it doesn't matter of, of your intellect. If you just do the right thing with the right effort, you'll get there. But for the Bhakti Yogi, the other two are a robotic approach to truth. The Bhakti Yogi is a real approach to truth. And this is where it's as if it's it's the opposite where it's not the presence of god in the room it's that the room is in the presence of god right in a mystical narrative i would say like saying i'm saying this through a mystical context <clears throat> so engulfed by multidimensional mystery <laughs> So these are different states. It's really a tension. So it's like it, there's this saying. Some some people say where attention goes, energy flows, or something. I would say it's not energy flows. Where attention goes is the energy. If if the person's attention is on weakness, then that's the energy. You know, <laughs> if the person's attention is on strength, then see, even it changes your, you can even change your voice. Like it's, you see, it's the, it, it's the attention. It's just the precision of the attention where it goes. That means if a person saw a, a, um, <clears throat> a good painting, they would have a certain emotion, right? If they saw a bad painting, they would have a certain emotion. And the painting in the outer realms, let's say a person walking in a museum. Now, let's say you close your eyes and you visual, you perceive a visualization or something, or you rem remember some memory or something. Okay. <clears throat> Revisualize a memory. <laughs> <clears throat> so that the memory could also give your attitude and influence. So what that means is the human behavior is from an inner and an outer realm. But society that thinks it's only the outer realms is is not seeing people's inner realm. So we feel people are just strange or odd or what's wrong. But it's actually a way more multidimensional scenario we're waking up to. And so how this is going to fit into the cultural program, it's like ask the caterpillar that went into the cocoon. <laughs> Because it's it's like it, we it's like can you call it death for the caterpillar that becomes a butterfly? Is that death? Like I I don't know if we can call that death. Technically, to the caterpillar's reality, yeah, it was death. There is no caterpillar existent in reality anymore, right? But the caterpillar became a butterfly. What's up with that? So so, <laughs> and you know it takes the ape. You know, it takes ma like the private like. Um, how can I say it? It took us a long time to evolve, but the caterpillars, like, watch this primate, you know, and the caterpillar just becomes a completely different creature, becomes a butterfly. It's like that evolution took so, that was very short. <laughs> Because there is more unknown than known, there is no glorification of the right behavior in this world. It's just 8 billion uh, advanced communicators smartening up in the sense of realizing in the outer realms, it's utility, no other purpose. It's like we are something to do something, doing is using being. That means how one is being is what they do. 
If I have an unpleasant thought, I'm telling you, I can become, I could totally see it animate, right? The inner realms can amplify anything. A person can say a simple sentence in a certain way and it can, it can burden your, uh, the person's heart or it can liberate them. And you know, there is no, I would say, um, in, when it comes to intelligence, they're just people who became conscious earlier. That's it. They just saw deeper dimensions. And I'm telling you, how many people can accept um, their simplest self, which is nothing? Like the mysteries of this realm surpass this normality we've Put around ourselves like a star, a scarf that's tied to heavy. You know, there's a fear. Like I personally, I'm going to share. I don't normally do this, but I feel for this episode, I should probably share it. I have a fear for myself like what happens is a uh, just a uh, existential being like what's going to happen to the individual world. then i have a fear for what's going to happen to the species but then i have a fear what's going to happen to the planet and then i have a fear of i can't see more anymore than that so beyond the visible content it's like there's nothing so what I'm saying is we are sandwiched between two giant unknown factors. The unknown uh, components of the self, which the mysteries are within, and the components of the world, which the mysteries are outside. Like, it's so mysterious. It's so mysterious, uh, I'm getting even tired of seeing this, this much mystery. <laughs> It's like, how's that person so calm? You know, it's like they got bored of everything. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I realize in this life, um, your attention is in any moment a person can keep the moment 50% known, 50% unknown. They can keep it 100% unknown. They can keep it 100% known. You keep it 100% known. You feel life is moving faster than you. You keep it 100% unknown. You feel you're moving faster than life. You keep it in the semi way. You leave yourself for a room to be surprised. That means it's as if what is the best state of mind to be in before one exits just conscious manifestation. To be in a wonder of the, the grand surprise. Can you imagine wielding a rhythm like that where every moment your, your, your eyes are opened, you're being surprised, the finite is being surprised by the infinite. It's, it's like there is so much more to our eyes. And if belief, like believing in sight, it's like, give me a break. The world is so off to do it. I got to believe, to, I got to see it to believe it. Whoever said that, it's like, I had it close their eyes. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> because the most fascinating quality of consciousness, you know, <clears throat> is that, uh, you can close your eyes and there is no light. There is no light entering your eyes, but you can see something. I am telling you, one can close their eyes and see something. Like we can try this out as an exercise right now. Everybody close your eyes and visualize an advanced civilization. <laughs> it's like Mr. Within's guided meditations, you know. <laughs> So 
some people give guided meditations and some people their meditation guides them <laughs> In the inner realms, one can visualize phenomena. There is no light. Who is seeing it? Conscious proof. Consciousness is, 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 is the one we're proving it to. Consciousness is the proof. And the true essence and texture of consciousness... I'm just here to say with this whole, you know... Mr. with an online alias. It's not in language. So the sooner our species treats language like an Iron Man suit, <clears throat> we will use this Iron Man suit to make civilization more rhythmic. In making it more rhythmic, then we incorporate an ethos. So right now, musicians have the biggest task until the species awakens its intellect to the multidimensional context of the realm, musicians have to create a bunker and a boat. And I feel that they, they have done that. Like it's, it's, it's incredible when you look at the reality of a multidimensional being, it's just the event in, in, in the living moment that is in the influence of you, you know? And so it's strange. It's as if it's as if in an ordered world, any time the order is not in balance, what we see chaos. And in a chaotic world, any time chaos is not in balance, we see order. It's it's like the, the dual mind has to, in some sense, uh, put down all the, its, its content and then stand up again. So this is how one wields imagination. Pretty much the fruit of this talk. You put down what you can't control. In the inner realms, I'm speaking. In the outer realms, the bodies... It's strange, but I want to say it's as if the body has a mind and the mind has the soul, you know? <clears throat> it's like the mind is a mind to itself and it's a mind to a body... <laughs> the soul is a is a soul to its mind is a soul to its body uh and it's a soul to the mind's own mind <laughs> the geometry can just stretch you put down everything that one can't do anything about and so, from your most simplest state of mind, you watch your intelligence happen. You take notes of your own intelligence, and then you will be it. It's like the whole Jungian synchronicity, it's just the synchronization of the inner realms and outer realms. Because the identity, is, we have to use the mind before um, to, to have a landscape to then explore that landscape as the mind. So I'm saying it's like a way where one has to um, just stare at the Iron Man suit before entering it and then <clears throat> enter it, you know, at a certain point. So think of it this way, that one wants to first study their own mind. I don't know how many, uh, you know, I don't think any teacher in the educational system gave, gave students an assignment. All right, students, go home and study your own mind. Study its origin. Study its intelligence. Study your DNA and unravel its gifts. If the mind, if one is the mind, they can't use it. There has to be an observer beyond it in an unknown way to feel it can do something really to itself. And the best way is, in some sense, simple, uh, you live simply. 
uh, you observe the simple states of your mind and then eventually you build up to the complex and it, if you have fear technically you can't have fear because if there's a fear of becoming simpler you have become content with the simple Because right now, as I'm telling people to explore their intelligence, uh, strangely, I have no idea what kind of intelligence people are going to find in, the, in their own selves. So every person has to have the discretion of being their own pilot and keep the humanized outer realms as headquarters in whatever pilot and keep that as the airport. It's as if um, we are be, we, we are trying to live as humans, then we, we will realize what is he, being human is a universal event. So technically this is why I feel we can, uh, the, uh, the rhythms come into play. Because um, it's strange. It's like it's like there's no reason for us to have imagination if we don't have to think about like the heart beating, the mind beating. I, well, am I not the mind? <laughs> if we if we have to think about the heart beating, for example, the lungs breathing, these are these are things that we don't think about. So what's the point of this conscious space of articulation? That means if it was survival of the fittest we should have been conscious of every cell of our body to make sure how it's surviving consciously, right? But why is the consciousness only designed to be just from the eyes uh, outward? I feel... Uh, let me tell you something incredible. <clears throat> something incredible recent. This is one of my recent discoveries I'm going to share. <clears throat> so I was seeing this painting where in this painting, it was showing like this snowy day with a bunch of people like building a snowman. This was a painting, small painting, framed painting I saw. <clears throat> and in this painting, there was this kid on a sled and there was a cat and the cat was breaking the fourth wall. And the fourth wall means is the cat was looking at the person looking at the painting, right? And for a moment, it made me think this idea in like certain, let's say, <clears throat> superstition bound cultures where they saw, they felt animals so perceived interdimensional beings. So then for a moment, I started to just you know, connect these parallels to a point where I thought, what if what is going on is that the future is happening right beside us? This is a strange idea, as if the past, present, future, there are three marathon runners running at different speeds. And I felt for a second, what if all these ideas of ghosts and all this stuff that we think is in some sense like that cat in the photo was aware of the future of that same moment. So I'll tell you this example. I'll, 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 I'll polish the metaphor this way. <clears throat> Imagine there's a person with a dog, uh, uh, let's say a, a person on a sled with a cat on their lap and that cat is looking um, uh, at, uh, out, outside of this painting, um, oh my God, I don't want to lose, uh, how do I say it? It's as if that, the, the animal was just aware of the future happening, uh, faster than now. I feel the interdimensional is our own future self, our own future selves, and it's a future realm happening faster than now. 
So imagine what that means is if 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 I had a cat, I don't have a cat, but <laughs> but if I had a cat, and that cat was like staring randomly at some corner of the room, there was nothing to stare at. I would like based on this ang structure of thought make this conclusion that right now I can see the future. The future is right here, right? But it's the, it's as if the cats are sensitive to it. But <laughs> like if a time traveler came in the room and had stealth technology, cats would pick up on that, you know. <laughs> cats are the best way. It's like to figure out time travel. <laughs> If somebody says what is crazy the answer is crazy is a noun it's like one room in a mansion And we feeling anything beyond that room is crazy. So this, this would come across as, in some sense, self-limitation. When the world is so unknown, our declaration of what is just the only reality is a... Let's go along with this line of thought that the past is a marathon runner <coughs> and... Uh, or let's say a person does something right now and their future already has happened and is watching them. So if the future is what if right now we are being a memory for our future self and our future self is watching us <clears throat> and let's say we don't notice it, but other phenomenology in the realm does we can notice it. And this may be a strange notion because we on, on one angle we say time is just a, a dot and it's as if two lines stretch from it and that um, in, in those two lines are like the past and the future. It's all uh, arising from the present. And then <clears throat> this is the view that the present is just a parallel to the future that has that will arrive. It's like having a parallel relationship with one's own memories or a perpendicular relationship with memories. Let's say somebody um, is trying to remember a memory that's perpendicular. A past moment is, is in intersecting with the present moment. Let's say somebody sees something in the moment and this reminds them of something of the past that's a parallel memory that's a parallel remembrance compared to let's say a perpendicular remembrance <laughs> i feel it's just um emotions um allow one to give into desire when one gives into desire um they can in some sense feel off rhythm. If they feel off rhythm, a rage will build up. If that rage bursts, they won't have a discretion to hold back. If they don't have the discretion to hold back, they will communicate themselves into ignorance. So what I would say is it's not there. It's like we don't know it. it how would I say it? It's like all mental illnesses are arising from the mind 
and how the mind defines itself in a changing world is one of adaption. Now, how we judge adaption and evolution, it's, it's in some sense impossible. How, how, do we, how do we measure an infinitely changing system? So, 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 so the limits of language, it's just, it's just uh, ignorant self, defi self uh, definitioning. I don't know if I can. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let, me, let me see where I can take this. I know one thing that bef in order to move, one needs space. And so if one studies the space where their mind is taking place and they be familiar they become familiar and they train in that space, then the content of that space becomes very clear to them. So it's, it's kind of like treating your mind like a rare event and learning from it as if you have become a disciple of how your intelligence is being the world right now. You learn, you serve your own mind, but you don't serve it in, in the blindness of belief or through uh, want, the anguish of wanting to get to heaven quickly. It's like strength and honor in the inner arms. The best way to to wield imagination. It's four a.m. right now, <clears throat> and I can totally say that to imagine something takes energy. <laughs> it definitely uses uh, something. And it's like, what do we do with a, with an intelligence that we don't know its full potential yet? Trust is like shielding your intel. It's like using your intelligence like a shield. Balance is kind of like, or an aim towards balance or justice. That would be like expression is like the sword of the mind and reception is like the shield of the mind. I don't know, maybe that's a better way of saying it. When people don't know who they are tomorrow, how could they judge themselves today? I mean, honestly, we can't, we don't know enough about who we will be to be certain of even thoughts now. So the world is even, there's even that angle. <clears throat> Anyways, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. Um, uh, I don't know where this picture is from, but I know that's supposed to be the uh, famous Elephant Island. You know, life is a gift, and the greatest effort of humanity is to open that gift. That means, uh, just like how many inventions there has been in the realm, there is a potential dormant. And if 8 billion human beings can activate the greatest potential of the species, I mean, then everybody can uh, not rest easy, but uh, work incredibly at least. Anyways, thanks for listening. Namaste.